Mr. Rogers is alive and well in the hearts and minds of millions of Americans. Even though Fred Rogers passed away in 2003, the legacy of Mr. Rogers' neighborhood remains lively with documentaries, books, a feature film, and related TV projects. One person who performed with Mr. Rogers is singer Francois Clemens, who moved to Middlebury, Vermont in 1997 to serve as artist in residence at the college. Dr. Clemens retired in 2013, but he continues to sing and speak to the public about the years he spent as Mr. Rogers' initially reluctant neighborhood police officer. Ah, I'm so glad, Lord, I got my legion on time, oh my Lord. Oh, my Lord. Singing has been with you all your life. How did you enjoy singing on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood? Well, uh, being with Fred and with people who appreciated me enhanced my singing. It enhanced it. He encouraged uh, me to explore uh, different um, repertoires. So I sang spirituals to start out with. But then I certainly, uh, he wrote a lot of songs. So I sang a lot of children's songs. There are many ways to say I love you. There are many ways to say I care about you. Many ways, many ways. I never realized children's songs carry such a message of love and hope and uh, trying things over again. What do you do with the anger that you feel? There are many uh, emotions that Fred dealt with that I never realized uh, how one solved some of these challenges in life through singing a song. But we're not delighted, we don't want snow here. We've had it and now we can go. If you were feeling sad, you could express it through these songs. Also, if I was working on a concert and I was doing Schubert or Mozart, I could sing them on the program. I would say, Fred say, what are you working on now, Francois? There's a boat that's leaving soon for New York. Come with me. One of my favorite moments was uh, I did Porgy and Bess. And in doing that, I, I got to sing all of the uh, arias of Sport and Life on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Come with me. That's where we belong. Fred really, really appreciated it. And when I did live concerts, I sang in Cleveland, in Chicago, in Philadelphia, in New York, and he came to those concerts. And many times when he came, he was sitting very quietly in the back or someplace where he was unobtrusive, and he would be the first person backstage. Uh, the next thing I know, I'd be, either I was walking off stage or I just got back to my dressing room, and there'd be this very, very gentle but firm knock, and it was Fred. Uh, sticking his head in the door. I, said, I, I, hear, I got here. And he had such a busy schedule. I was a tremendously honored and flattered and filled with deep gratitude that he, he would take the time from that schedule, whether he had to drive or fly. I mean, he, you know, he lived in Pittsburgh and I lived in New York and he showed up. It was a deep, wonderful sense of gratitude that I felt for him doing things like that. Well, so many people <laughs> enjoy Fred Rogers and his legacy, and there's this documentary, Won't You Be My Neighbor. Love is at the root of everything. Love or the lack of it. What do you enjoy about the documentary? Well, first of all, I, I got to meet Morgan Neville, who I think is a genius. I'm not the first one to tell him that. He knows it. He has a touch. You know, uh, Fred was not Hollywood. He chose to stay in Pittsburgh. Now, there's nothing wrong with Hollywood, but that's not Fred Rogers. He's a sophisticated country boy. Is that possible? <laughs> a world traveler, a very intelligent man, but he, he uh, stayed away from the limelight. He liked uh, ordinary people. He liked quiet. He was a thinker. This movie understands that. And uh, Neville uh, allowed him his quiet corner. He's an observer. I'm not feeling blue right now, though. Me neither. <laughs> I think they did a great job. I really do. 
I've seen the, the movie about 35, 40 times. I'm not exaggerating. Uh, the company that's producing it, promoting it, invited me to come and make some guest appearances. And they proved to be incredibly successful. I love doing live. They can't have too many for me. I could do one almost every day. I really enjoyed it. The first thing I realized after a couple of appearances is that it's not the little children coming. These are adults who saw the program 20, 25 years ago. They are frequently married with families of their own. They have children. And they want to recapture some of the joy and uh, wonderful huggy feelings that they had about Fred Rogers. Some of the things that he talk, talked about because we have a lot of problems in our society today. So I think people have a chance to put their burdens aside and step into a, a, a world that's, that is kind, that is considered, that does express love without uh, wanting something or there's this uh, atmosphere of meanness sometimes in our society. So I think the, they have a chance to listen, sit down and listen to a serious adult talk about some of the uh, problems that we have when they watched the program years ago, they perhaps heard the message in a certain way. But now they're adults and they hear the same words, but they have a different meaning to, to a, a man or a woman. And I can tell you, uh, 1968, I guess it was, when Bobby Kennedy got shot in, in California there. Uh, Fred had to go on television and do a special. And Lady Aberlin and, and uh, uh, Daniel Tiger did this tender scene where he mentioned the word assassination. You know, we have violence in our society that we have not solved this problem. You know, 25, 30, 50 years later, we still have assassinations. So the adults come with those same questions, but they, they want to discuss them in an adult way. And other issues uh, uh, that are happening in terms of who we let into this country and what people do when they come here, and uh, they, they want to discuss those things. There are also issues concerning sexuality, now, there are people who say to me, well, he didn't love you in the beginning, did he? Uh, he didn't want you to come out, and he would not approve of trans and the bathroom situations that we have. And I said, no, 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 no. He did approve of me from the beginning. He didn't feel I should be out on screen. And publicly, he didn't want people to have something to talk about. This is what we talked about privately. Like, we're in the studio, and he said to me, there are people who will say bad things. We don't want that. And also, there would be a problem with those who are advertisers and underwriters and contributors. And he named them like Sears and Heinz and Johnson and Johnson. He said, I don't think they would stick with me if you were an openly gay person. It's not about you, Francois. I love you. And you'll always be a part of my life. But that cannot be now. Our society is not ready. And I understood that. I had no argument with him. I understood it. I made a decision. And my decision was to sacrifice my sexual expression and to spend my time spiritually, give myself to my race because people were going to judge. So I picked up my burden and I carried it. And there are many people now who understand what a sacrifice. I've never had a lover because I would not allow myself to be close to people so that there would be evidence. By the way, I love what I'm doing. <laughs> when I sing, something inside of me turns on. I'm deeply, deeply enriched by this life that I've been given. And this is not something anybody could do. I, I warned you, don't, don't try this <laughs> if you're not called to it. So you could not have worn that earring on the show? No, you couldn't do anything, out, any outward signs that showed you were, you know, a male who, who liked men. But I, I had my ear pierced anyway. I just, uh, you know, a little makeup and we just didn't uh, focus on it during the, the filming and stuff. How are you doing, Fred? Good, friends. I wanted my friends to see in your uniform. I had a tough time being Officer Clemens because the, in the ghetto, the policeman is the villain. And I grew up in the ghetto. And when I was a boy, the policemen were not nice in Youngstown, to, uh, not where I grew up, to, to the kids. And a lot of times, uh, they were either beating black boys up with their billy clubs, and unfortunately, occasionally, they shot one here and shoot one there. So I, I stayed away from them. 
my mother, different members of my family gave me that survival talk. Stay away from them. Keep your eyes down. Don't answer back. And don't go around. If you see the cop car, go the other way. And Fred said, he told me the story that his mother told him that there were helpers. And he said, well, friends, maybe you could change that image. You could become a helper. I wanted to do something good. I wanted to change that image. And I said that to him. So he, I said, let's, let's see what I can do to help. So I put on the uniform. It's like, again, picking up your burden and deciding all the good things you can try to do to change that image. So it was very difficult for you at first to play a police officer on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, but ultimately, has something good come out of your playing a police officer? Well, a lot of good has come out of it. As a matter of fact, since we've done the movie, I've been getting just more and more fan mail where people write to me and say, I am a black man and I am a black policeman. I became a policeman because of you. Nothing shocks me more. I never thought I'd have an influence like that on people. I am a policeman. I've been a policeman for 20, 15, 20 years, and I like uh, the image that you uh, project, Mr. Clemens, and I'm proud to be a policeman. I, I serve our community. And here we have different offense reports, mm -hmm. and this usually includes more serious kinds of crimes. I expected people to say, I sing because I was introduced to classical music. Now that I've heard all along, but to be a police officer, I wasn't ready for that. Totally unexpected. Totally unexpected. And a blessing. Yes, I consider it a blessing. I hope it continues to grow like that because we know that all policemen are not bad. They're not. They're hard working people, many of them. But the bad ones sure do make it hard for those who are trying to do a good job, be fair. And that was Fred Rogers' idea. Yeah, totally his idea. Wasn't mine. I never would have done it without him, you know, insisting the way he did. And th things turn out many times so much better than you think you're capable. So all I can say is he had a different vision than I did. I'm glad I took a chance and decided to go with his vision. Well, the producers of the movie had their own vision. If you had personally made the documentary, mm -hmm. what would you have done differently? Uh, well, I'm speaking very selfishly, I would have sung this, the, the soundtrack for one thing. <laughs> Being a musician, I definitely would have sung the soundtrack. Uh, when people see the documentary, I think they tend to focus on Fred. I don't think they quite understand how much the other members of the neighborhood contributed. Uh, it's, a, it's an appropriate view. There are many different ways to do a documentary on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. But then when you see the documentary, and I enjoyed it. Like I said, I've seen it about 40 times. But you don't understand how much was going on that I brought to the screen, to the show, that Lady Aberlin brought to the show. She was in every show, and she's a very creative artist, but the focus was so much on Fred and the psychological things, which he did, and the research that he did, and the unique way that he has of teaching children, that I think they lost the way she embraces children and teaching. And I think that that's something they could have done in the same manner the effect that Johnny's music had on people. Everywhere I would go around the country, people would say, who's that jazz musician? Who is that playing that music? Now they did do some of it. It wasn't like it wasn't, they glossed over it and threw it away. But you have to feature what Johnny's doing, in my opinion, more, much more. He's more of a partner than the movie implies. That's what I, I feel people don't, they don't get it. So it sounds like maybe in a few years, we could have another documentary about the ensemble and how everyone contributed to that show. I think that would be very appropriate because uh, in addition to that, you had Joe Negri, who was there from the beginning. And particularly when we did those operas, we put those together, there was a lot of creativity going on. You could do a, a movie on just the operas. And people love them. You could just do one after the other and deal with some very, very serious issues of growing up. I'm just back from the ocean where the waves are coming in fast. The banana boat captain is asking how long we think it will last. One of the most important scenes in the movie that I liked very much 
had to do with one of the earlier scenes that I did with Fred where on a very, very sunny day, I'm walking past his house and he's sitting out in front of the house on a chair. Would you like to join me? That looks awfully enjoyable, but I don't have a towel or anything. Oh, you share mine. Okay, sure. So I take my boots off and my socks, I put my feet down, and America sees a black man, brown man, and a white man with our feet together in this water. That's no big deal, really. People have been doing that all over the world, but not in America. Fred doesn't do things accidentally. And I think there are a lot of things for people to think about when they see that scene. Thank you for your refreshments. Oh, I'm glad you like it. <laughs> well, Mr. Rogers and you on the show certainly dealt with racial issues in a very subtle, gentle way. But how did Fred Rogers deal with racial issues in his personal life? Well, I was very frustrated uh, by some of the issues that I dealt with. So a lot of times I would bring those issues up and tell him what was on my mind. Uh, there was a, a health club in uh, Oakland that was uh, only whites allowed, and he had a membership to that club. He withdrew his membership was one of the ways. There was another time when uh, Bobby Kennedy got killed, and there was rioting going on, Dr. King. Uh, people were upset about all these things, and there was a, a, a fire, and you could hear gunshots. It was only about five or six blocks from my house. And Fred came up to, to my house and said, throw some things in a piece of luggage and get in this car. It's not safe for you. I lived close two blocks from the ghetto. And he, we got my luggage, threw some stuff in it, got in the car, and I stayed with him for about three weeks to a month. Uh, I, I really, uh, it, it also helped me inside to feel protected, that someone cared about me, uh, something could have happened, and. I, I began to understand the nature of our relationship. I, I was not just going to be thrown away if, by circumstances in Pittsburgh. Also, so if I were auditioning for uh, an, an opera or something, and I, what I discovered was the opera uh, impresarios would have these auditions and I didn't hear about them. And sometimes that was, it was so uh, disappointing sometimes to find out because I was really struggling to make a living as a singer. My friends would say, why weren't you at the audition last night? What audition? I never even heard about it. Well, in some instances, Fred would know the person who ran that opera company or knew about them. He called them up on the telephone and said, so and so, so and so, this is Fred Rogers. Oh, yes, yes, yes. They would have this conversation between them. And he would say, I happen to have here a young man in my office. His name is Francois Clemens. He's a wonderful singer. I've been working with him on the program, and he says there was an audition last night and that he didn't know anything about it. Well, I'm sure there was some mistake. Would you grant him an audition? I understand you're doing blah, blah opera. There's a wonderful role for him in that opera, and it would please me to no end if you would be kind enough to give him an audition. Every single time he did that, they gave me an audition. And several times, I even got hired. Several times I actually wanted to stop because I felt it was humiliating to continually have to go to someone and say, why aren't you treating him fair? I didn't want a leg up, I just wanted to be treated fair. And it was exasperating and he would say, nope, you're supposed to go there and knock on that door. You cannot quit. He was uh, just so supportive. Is he still with you today, would you say? <laughs> what an interesting question. Yes is the answer. I probably talk with him more since that untimely death uh, in 2003, February 27, now than, than he was then. Yes. I wrote a book uh, over the past summer and before focusing on how I met Fred Rogers and what I felt about working with this man who so many people uh, idolized and loved, I feel almost like he channeled it through me. I would talk to him. I was by myself, and I would sit at my desk upstairs, and I would say what I wanted to write about or think about what I wanted to write about, and the, uh, the thoughts, the words would just start like cascading. But I would feel this presence, and, and it was him. I feel that it was him. 
Uh, I talked to Joanne at one point, his wife, and uh, she too says the same thing. She feels his presence. Uh, but it brings me incredible comfort. <laughs> so I don't usually talk about it. <laughs> Uh, most people are not ready for it, but for me it's real. Many ways to say I love you. I'm so proud of you, Francois. Oh, thank you, Fred. The documentary Won't You Be My Neighbor is available from Focus Features. And for more stories about people who shine brightly, head to mountainlake.org slash spotlight. Spotlight is supported by the Glenn and Carol Pearsall Adirondack Foundation, dedicated to improving the quality of life for year-round residents of the Adirondack Park.